Uh, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, further to the opening speaker, I take a broader definition of what localization is and means. In the interest of fairness, as a Tory, I went to the BBC uh, for a definition. But it said, globalization is the world becoming increasingly interconnected as a result of massively increased trade and cultural exchanges. And that is the theme I wish uh, to explore tonight. Looking round the room tonight, let's go forward 5, 10, 15 years. I wonder what proportion of you in that time frame will have lived and worked abroad at some point. I would contend it would be quite high. And contrast it to my generation, I started university 30 years ago. And yes, you could go abroad, but the opportunities were much less than they are today. And I will contend that the ability of the world to interconnect is a force for good. English students amongst you will know the work of E.M. Forster uh, in Howard's End. His central theme was only connect. The prose and the passion, and both will be enriched. And I think that is correct. Let's look at the cultural connections through history. Music, art, cuisine, all the things that enrich life are themselves enriched by different cultures and traditions being exposed to each other and often fusing into something better. We have a greater understanding of different religions, cultures, traditions, that with greater understanding, I believe, comes less tension. Phobia, the word means fear. Fear of something different. Fear of the unknown. The constituency I represent, Milton Keynes, uh, is a very diverse community. In our primary schools, there are 156 different languages spoken. And part of my job as the MP is going around seeing all these different communities. Yes, very different in many ways, but actually when you go below the surface, there's a, so many similarities. And it's that connection, that understanding, that I think is a force uh, for good. As well as personal career opportunities, I think it is enriching personally. It is Valentine's uh, night uh, tonight. I am in a whole world of trouble because when I agreed to do this debate, I completely forgot that it is not just Valentine's night, uh, but my anniversary. <laughs> That's going to cost me quite a bit uh, to rectify. But I mention this because my partner is of Hong Kong Chinese origin. He was born and grew up in Malaysia, itself a very diverse country. He came here to study uh, uh, ultrasonic engineering. And because of that, he made that choice. He was able to travel halfway around the world. I then met him. And he is what I hope will be my lifelong partner. Yes, people have traveled before. Of course they have. But the ability to travel more, to interact with different people right around the world, again, I see is a force for good. And that interaction brings all sorts of innovations in science and technology and development. <coughs> Much faster than would happen if we were more isolated blocks. I've got in my pocket an iPhone, probably made in China, American company. We've all got probably one of these. When I think back to my time at school, there was a computer room that had one computer in it for the entire school. A BBC Micro, if anyone remembers it. It cost the equivalent of £1,500, more than this, and, and a 32-bit, whatever it was, processor. The ability now that we have this technology at our hands, I would contend, 
is accelerated because of globalisation. It makes available to us far more goods and treatments than would otherwise be the case. The proponent said, look at global poverty changing since 1990. I'm actually going to cite some different statistics. For all the problems in the world, there are lots of good things happening. Look at some of the main indicators. Illiteracy rates. 50 years ago, one in four young people did not have basic literacy. It's now less than one in ten. Infant mortality. Lifespans are all vastly better. We are healthier, living longer, are better educated in this world because of globalisation. Now, I say globalisation is not new, but it is accelerating. And I fully accept that that will prevent, uh, cause some downsides. We have to deal with the problem of the unaccountability of huge uh, multinationals. Companies that are too big to fail as we saw at a foretaste, indeed, in the financial crash a decade or so ago. <coughs> there is what you would call, might call the speed of contagion. That might be financial. If a market crashes in one part of the world, very quickly will affect the rest. Medical contagion. Coronavirus. In the air at any one second of the day, there are over a million people airborne spreading goodness knows what around the world. And for many people it's a sheer pace of change that is unsettling and causes problems. People feel left behind. And that's why in parts of the world you see uh, the mainstream centre-left, centre-right parties failing to connect uh, with the public. And into that vacuum come the nationalists, the extremists, the disruptors. But those can be dealt with. It's not the fault of globalisation itself. It's how we react to it. And the job of politicians like me, uh, civic society more generally, the corporate world, <coughs> has to find solutions to, to these. I believe they can. And it's often in that challenge that we will find the solutions. Will we, yes, coronavirus might spread uh, faster around the world than if we were more isolationist. But the global connectivity, I would contend, is more likely to find uh, the vaccine, the cure, much faster than would otherwise be the case. And in any event, it's going to happen anyway. We can't just stop it happening. That force is going to continue. It's how we deal with it that matters. If we embrace it, if we connect more, understand more, cooperate more, then not just economically, but culturally, socially, in terms of living together on one planet, we can all be enriched. It's evolution. It's going to happen. I think it's a good thing, as long as we deal with the downsides. Thank you very much.